All right, this is going to be your EOC review for the organism domain. Oh, and once again, as we go through this, this isn't meant for you to take notes from. This is just meant for you to just kind of listen and review as we work through the slides. So first of all, control versus experimental groups. So control is what must be kept the same or the normal. Experimental is what changes during the experiment. And for that, we have two types, independent variable and dependent variable. Important to note that independent is what I change as a scientist. Dependent is what is observed. You have no control over the dependent. It's what you measure. All right, so how do we check to see what is the independent and what is the dependent? You put it in a sentence. So independent causes a change in dependent. So here we go. In a study done in room 1304, Scientists were interested to see if the grade of students in the cafe determined how many sandwiches they could eat. Here's the data. So what's the independent? So what do I change as the scientist? Well, I'm going to change the grade of the students. So I'm testing different grades. So grade. What's the dependent or what are you measuring? Number of sandwiches. Now put it into a sentence. Grade causes a change in sandwiches. So there's two types of data. There's qualitative and quantitative. So qualitative is a quality or a characteristic. You cannot measure it. So color, texture, smell. Quantitative is a quantity. It's a number. And something like height, weight, volume, something you can measure. All right, so characteristics of life or things living, living things share. There's eight total. The first is all living things are made of cells. This is the basic unit of life. There's two different terms. Unicellular, which is one cell. Multicellular, which is many cells. Next, all living things reproduce. Living things are going to produce offspring that resemble them. There's two types. Asexual is only one parent. Sexual requires two parents. All living things are based on a genetic code. Inheritance of traits is carried on DNA. Very important. All living things grow and develop. So growth is an increase in size and shape. Development is maturing over time. And it's also important to note that all living things have a lifespan. They live and then die. All living things use and need energy. So energy comes from food and it maintains the body. There's different types of ways of getting this food though. You have autotrophs which make their own food, heterotrophs which have to eat their food, and decomposers which break down dead material for food. All living things respond to stimuli, so re reaction to a stimulus is a response. Like in this picture, you touch a hot pan, you're going to pull your hand back because it hurts, or you wake up when an alarm clock goes off. Those are all responding to stimuli. Next is maintaining homeostasis. So if you remember, the definition of homeostasis is an internal balance, or should I say a constant internal balance? Examples are things like blood pressure, heat, heart rate, body temperature, um, other things. If you are diabetic or you know someone who's diabetic, you know about blood sugar. So your blood sugar level, your blood pH level, those are all things that the body has to keep constant. And last, number eight, is all living things evolve and adapt. So they adapt to long-range changes. They result in better species survival. And it takes place over a long period of time, which is important to note. And it involves the entire species, not just an individual. So there's seven levels of characterizing something. And above kingdom, we know that domain is larger than kingdom. And how we remember this is deer... King, Philip, came over for great spaghetti. So the first letter of each of these corresponds with these over here. 
So binomial nomenclature, how do we name things? So it's a two-name naming system. It's always either italicized or underlined. The underlined is more if you're writing it um, by hand. You can't write in italics. So the first name is the genus, and the first letter is capitalized. The second name is the species identifier, identifier, and it's all lowercase. So our example here, humans are homo sapiens, so that first letter is capitalized. The rest is all lowercase. So cladistics, this is a spot where you might want to pause the video and just read through these vocab terms. So cladistics shows evolutionary relationships. A cladogram then shows these relationships. Phylogeny is the same thing as those evolutionary relationships, and there's two different types of traits. We have an ancestral trait and a derived trait. Ancestral traits are within the entire line of the group of organisms, while derived are not present in all members of the species, but as we go through the cladogram. So kingdoms. There's six major kingdoms that we talk about. So we have, these are our eukaryotic kingdoms and then our prokaryotic kingdoms. So kingdom archaeobacteria. Like I said, these are prokaryotes. They're usually single-celled. They can be heterotrophs or autotrophs and they cannot move. Most of them are unable to move. But most importantly, they live in extreme conditions. So there's three divisions of those extreme conditions, methanogens, thermophiles, and halophiles. Eubacteria is that traditional prokaryotic bacteria that you think of when you hear bacteria. They're also unicellular, although they have cell walls. They can be autotrophic or heterotrophic, and these are found in soil, water, the human body, your food. They do require oxygen, so they can't live in those crazy environments. Protista, remember, these are eukaryotic organisms, which is why they're not considered bacteria, even though most of them are single-celled. This is also called the junk drawer kingdom because it's pretty much just a little bit of everything thrown in. And they're classified by how they get nutrition. So they're either autotrophic or plant-like, heterotrophic or animal-like, or dead decaying matter, saprotrophic. Really important to note, too, they need moist conditions to survive. And... Things like algae and seaweed are also protists. They're not plants, so please, please, please remember that. Kingdom fungi, these are also your eukaryotic organisms, and they're mostly multicellular, although yeast is unicellular. These are heterotrophs, or decomposers. So they don't do photosynthesis, and they can't move. They reproduce via spores, and they do have a cell wall. Examples that you should be familiar with, mushrooms, molds, blue cheese, and some parasites such as ringworm. So some other important fungi structures. So in general, they have a high surface area to volume ratio. So think about a mushroom, but it's not very heavy. Hyphae provides the surface area, and it's specifically adapted for that growth on solid surfaces. They also have the mycelium, which is that nut-like mass, and the fruiting body, which is the portion that has the spores. So we look at this picture, the hyphae kind of weaves all through, that's all of this. The fruiting body is just the above ground portion. Mycelium is below ground portion. So symbiotic relationships with fungi, so lichens and mycorrhizae. So with lichens, it's between fungus and the algae, and the algae provides the food for both, and the fungus provides a web for algae to grow. The mycorrhizae is between fungus and plant roots. This helps farmers a lot because it helps that absorption for the plant and increases that surface area, which if you increase your, increase your surface area, you're taking up more water and minerals, so you grow a better plant. Benefits of fungi, so bioremediation, it cleans the environment. Okay, we recycle to clean medicines, so penicillin, things that control blood pressure, contractions, and then we also eat them as foods, mushrooms, yeast, alcohol, and cheese. Kingdom plantae, then, is also eukaryotic and multicellular, and once again, they don't move. But they are autotrophs, so they do photosynthesis. They can be found on land or in shallow water, and they have cell walls. They can reproduce asexually or sexually, and those roots, like we just talked about, absorb moisture and nutrients. Human benefits, they produce oxygen, they're a food source, also a source of medicine. So there's two types of vascular tissue in plants. You have xylem and phloem. So xylem carries water and minerals. I always remember it alphabetically. WX is the order of the alphabet. So water, 
goes with xylem. And it's only in one direction and moves up the stem. Phloem transports nutrients or food, which is also known as sugar. So I remember this as PS. So phloem, sugar. And this is bi-directional, moves up or down. There's three types of plant groups. So we have the non-vascular, which is the mosses. Seedless vascular, which is ferns. They actually produce spores. And then seed-producing vascular is everything else. Angiosperms and gymnosperms are both seed producing, but they're two different types. So angiosperms, seeds are enclosed. They're known as fruiting or flowering plants. So if you look over here, things like an apple is an angiosperm. Gymnosperms are not part of the fruit. The name actually means naked seed. These are things like pine cones where the seeds are exposed when the cone opens. So here's a spot where you should pause and really kind of review the parts of a flower. Remember that this is the female section and these are the male sections of the flower. So how are animals classified? So animals are either invertebrates or vertebrates. Remember invertebrates have no backbone and surprisingly they're 95% of animals. Vertebrates on the other hand do have a backbone but these are only 5% of animals, but we seem to know the most about these fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals like us. So body support. So invertebrates have exoskeleton. If you remember, exo means out. So it's an outside skeleton. These are why bugs crunch when you step on them. Or if you eat crab legs, you have to break the crusty outside part open to get to the meat on the inside. They're all invertebrates. Vertebrates have an endoskeleton. Endo means in, so their skeleton's internal, like this fish down here. There's all that body tissue and muscle outside of the skeleton. So body movement. Most animals can move at some point in their life, so mobile means they can move. This is using, you know, feet, figs, le feet, fins, feet, legs, wings, anything an animal would use to move. Sessile means you cannot move. Now, even though these organisms, like a sea anemone, look like they're sessile their entire life, actually as juveniles, they do move. So all animals at some point move in their lifetime. Now there's body plants. So symmetry is similarity among those body structures. So there's three types of symmetry. So we have asymmetry, which is right here. Radial, which means you can cut it multiple ways and it's all going to be the same or bilateral, which means you can only cut it in one direction, right down the middle. Most animals that have a brain, you are bilaterally symmetrical. All right, so body arrangement. So we have dorsal ventral, which are opposite. This is easy to remember because most of you think about the dorsal fin of a shark or a whale or a dolphin. It's on its back. Ventral is the belly. Posterior is the butt end or anal end. Anterior is the mouth end or oral end. Maintaining homeostasis. So quick review of homeostasis. Remember, that's keeping that constant internal environment. So a lot of organisms are endothermic, meaning they maintain their body heat on their own. But some things are ectothermic, like reptiles. And they need to interact with the environment. This is why animals like this bask in the sun. They need to soak up that heat like reptiles and different snakes and turtles and things you see. So metamorphosis is just changes to go from egg to adult. This is very common in insects. There's two types. There's incomplete and complete. So incomplete is three different stages. They basically look like miniature adults the whole time. So an incomplete is going to be over here with the grasshopper. A complete is for different stages and they all look very different. So you go from an egg to a caterpillar to this cocoon to the full adult butterfly. So invertebrate classification, we have major invertebrate phyla. I would pause this here and go through everything. So periphera are the sponges, nadaria are the jellyfish, mollusca, snails, clams, squid, octopus, worms. There's three different types. We have platyhelminthes, which are flatworms, Nematoda roundworms, or Annelida, which are segmented worms. There's also echinoderms, starfish, sea urchins, anything that's like star-shaped. And then arthropods are your insects, spiders, crabs, shrimp, all of those crusty crustaceans that you would see. 
And then phylum chordata, these are your vertebrates. So there's major chordate classes. So you have the jawless fish, Ignatha, chondrichthys, which have cartilage, so C and C, that's easy to remember, C and C. Osteichthys are bony. O and bony starts in, starts with an O for osteichthys. Amphibias, amphibians, reptilias, reptiles, avis as birds, and mammalia as mammals. And once again, I'd pause here and review, but otherwise, you are done.